Goy, Goy in and I put the Lorentz transformation Goldstein statement in and the first reviewer says, what's the difference? They look the same to me. They aren't really. Here it says that the clock runs at the instantaneous rate. In other words, the clock is driven by velocity and velocity only. And I cite the muon storage <laughs> ring to show that, in fact, the 10 to the 8th G doesn't affect the frequency of decay of a muon, only its velocity in that ring. So we know, so we're quite sure that the, the frequency is affected by the velocity and the velocity only, but you can't instantaneously adjust to that frequency rate. Okay, uh, again, we're probably a little out of order, but let's go ahead. And now, uh, that's okay. Let's go back to that one. Uh, the, the two versus, uh, the one versus the other, the ILT requires the speed of light is always measured as the isotropic value of C, whereas the other one, the two clocks separating in a long velocity direction will remain synchronized as the frame is accelerated. This implies a constantly changing clock difference because that's required if you're going to measure C, which uh, is, is measured from, uh, from uh, an, another standard. The speed of light will not be measured as isotropic value of C unless the clocks are resynchronized if, if Goy is right with his clock hypothesis. So they're significantly different, and we're going to try to show that, in fact, the implication of, of Goy is the one that, uh, that's right. Uh, a, a little bit of bypass, uh, a little bit of, uh, of mathematics to show that, in fact, in some cases, clock biases are generated naturally. And in fact, here's one. I've got a moving frame V, and then I have a clock that's moving in that frame by an all, a small velocity V. And if I look at the frequency effect, incidentally, that delta F should be delta F over F zero. It's the fractional change. Uh, what what is really critical is this, the, the two terms on the end when you square that, that V plus V, the V squared and the small V squared uh, are easy to explain. The, the small V squared can become negligible by moving V, the clock, at a real slow rate. So slow clock movement is what people often use to calibrate one clock with another one. Uh, the first term, V squared, orbital velocity, affects all clocks on the Earth in the same manner, but the middle term is kind of interesting. It integrates into a clock bias. When I take V as the partial of X with respect to T and integrate that, I get a clock bias term. It turns out, and in fact in one of my early papers I showed this, that clock biases are naturally generated on Earth exactly like this, and this is what makes it look like the speed of light is C on the Earth. But let's go on. Uh, the Lorentz transformation is shown here. T transforms and X transforms. I like Celery's transform, and we'll talk a little more about that. He says, yes, clocks do change, but there's no clock bias term in it. And in fact, he says position changes. It turns out in the forward direction, this is identical with the Lorentz transformation in position. But in the reverse direction, Lorentz puts another gamma. He does a double shortening whereas the uh, salary undoes the shortening, which uh, we'll see is, is a little more logical. <clears throat> in any case, the difference in time, it turns out, is exactly equal to that term, including the velocity of the Earth and the X position in the Earth's frame that we derive from that slide just in front. So, uh, so there is a clock difference between the Lorentz and the salary transformations. That is exactly that clock bias term, okay? Uh, okay, ILT's, uh, the infinitesimal Lorentz transformation would require a constantly changing clock bias. But we saw that clock bias was a function of velocity and position, not acceleration. And that's why this does not work, and that's why the ILT doesn't work. If you were to resynchronize your clocks, yes, you could measure the speed of light because Einstein resynchronization, in fact, creates exactly that same clock bias. Okay? Uh, just to give a little, little evidence for it, the GRACE satellite gravity recovery and climate experiment, they put uh, GPS receivers in those two clocks and they send signals back and forth between them. And it turns out they use the GPS time 
time at transmission, time at receipt. In effect, that's including the Sagnac velocity effect into that. So that if you just look at the instantaneous difference in the speed of light between them, you'd get C plus V and C minus V. In other words, they keep these clocks synchronized in the non-rotating Earth-centered inertial frame by using GPS to time the signals. And then they use uh, the time of transmission and the time of receipt, uh, not the instantaneous position between the two. Okay? Uh, just uh, another effect, the Sagnac effect, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, the one-way <coughs> Sagnac effect is claimed to apply in GPS measurements, and they claim it's the result of the Earth's rotation. I once computed it's something like the curvature on the surface of the Earth is something in the few nanometers. Uh, so that much curvature to create a big, huge 29-meter effect at the equator looks like it's stretching things. Let's look at it. <coughs> Wang, in a very recent, uh, I think 2003, constructed fiber optic gyros and showed that the Sagnac effect still applied without any air area in the equation. Virtually all Sagnac equation you'll see includes the area, but if you retranslate that, you can put it in terms of the velocity of, of the moving fiber and the length of that fiber in the direction of the movement. So uh, he pretty conclusively proved that it's a linear effect and it has nothing to do with rotation. Let's go on. Uh, the GPS design document, I just point out that it says the distance has to be expressed as the receipt time, T sub R, minus the transit time of, uh, of, uh, of the satellite. So the, uh, again, it shows the Sagnac effect is present by, in the design document to get the right answers in GPS. Okay? <coughs> Here's that equation I was mentioned. That generally, the Sagnac effect, and it's a two-way Sagnac effect, generally when they rotate, they send the beam in opposite directions. In GPS, it's one way, and they manage to put it in a form that's pretty close to the, the original. It's only half as big because it's <laughs> one way. They said it's two times omega over c squared times r sub a times r sub b. Well, r sub a is a vector from the center of the Earth to the receiver, and r sub b is the vector of the satellite signal path. And it turns out that's the area of, a, of that triangle that gets swept out as the signal moves from the satellite to the receiver. But Wang and, and all proved that it was better written, the general case that applies not only when it's circular but, uh, but when it includes no area, is that it's twice the velocity times the length over c squared. I can take the GPS form and put it into a form where I, where I call the velocity of the receiver times the receiver's position in the along track velocity direction, divided by c squared, minus the velocity of the receiver again, and the satellite position in the along track velocity direction over c squared. But then I could cancel that out by putting a clock bias of minus v over vxr over c squared, which is exactly the clock bias that we showed difference between Lorentz and Celery transformations. Now, we can't do that for all these receivers because they're all spinning in a different direction. So I can't put a clock bias in the satellite that will account for that. So we have to do a Sagnac correction in our navigation. But I can do that for the orbit because the orbital velocity is the same at all receivers. So let's go ahead. Okay, next claim. Um, Ashby again in what's generally referred to as the GPS Bible claims that the sun's gravitational field is canceled because we're in free fall on the earth. It's free falling towards the sun. Actually what happens is the sun's gravitational field, the gradient of it, in other words the difference of the satellite on one side of the earth and the difference on the satellite clock on the other side of the earth is just enough different that if you integrate that to, to halfway or quarter way around the orbit. Actually, it's the whole upper half and the bottom half. If you integrate that, you change the clock bias exactly the right amount to, to counteract the fact that I'm not going in a straight line path. My velocity vector, my along track x distance, has changed direction. And it turns out in each case it's the gradient or the derivative with